This woman at the well, this Samaritan woman, she is asking Jesus a question about worship that he is the big dispute in her community about worshiping God. Whether we should go and worship God at this mountain or at the temple. And Jesus doesn't answer her question because sometimes the answer is not nearly as important as asking the right question. If you're asking the wrong question, it doesn't matter what the answer is. And Jesus said, Jesus in His answer is, is really saying to her, it doesn't matter if you worship here or there. The place is not important. But how we worship in spirit and in truth. I think sometimes we get mixed up with our worship. Our worship becomes a response to what's happening on the platform instead of a response to God for what He has done and who He is. And it's almost as if we've gotten so used to being entertained. We go to concerts and shows and we watch TV and we're used to being entertained. That's why preachers can't preach more than 30 minutes because now you're used to after 30 minutes of watching something, you get up and go to the refrigerator. We're used to being entertained. And we bring that mentality to church. And it's about what is the worship doing for me and what is the preaching doing for me instead of understanding that we come not to receive but to worship God. And our worship is not a response for the music. It's not a response for the singing. It's not a response for what's going on on the platform. But our worship is a response to what God has done for us. God has been good. And so if the singers sing off key, He's still worthy of our worship and our praise. If if the preaching isn't any good, I'm still going to worship God because I'm not doing it for the preacher. I'm not doing it for the singers. I'm worshiping God who has been good to me. Worship fulfills The ultimate command. Jesus said that the two big commands, that if you get these right, all of the other law and the prophets hang on two commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. Love your neighbor as yourself. On these two, all the, all the law and the prophets hang. Worship is part of loving God. It is a way that we love God. Worship fulfills this ultimate command. And Paul says that the ultimate sin in Romans chapter 1 that starts all of the spiral of sin that we see him talk about, that the first sin is that we choose not to glorify God. As God. But instead, we worship the creation instead of the Creator. We are so wired to worship that we worship something. It is not that we choose to worship or not to worship, but it is that we are so wired and created to be worshipers that we have to worship. Something. 
and you become like what you worship. If you worship material, you worship things, you become greedy. You worship power, you become corrupt. You worship Christ, you become Christ-like. What is it that we worship? Do we worship in front of the mirror? Stand in front of the mirror and say, man, look at me. (laughs) You're talking about me. (laughs) Worship was not invented by man. It is commanded by God and it is what we are wired and created to do. Worship, because we are created by God for worship, everyone should worship the Lord. Even sinners. The Bible says, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. If you inhale God's air, you ought to exhale God's praise. We borrow His air, and that's how we live. So we ought to thank God for giving us life and breath and realize that everything... That's why Paul said, in Him we live and move and have our being. Everything, every moment that we live, we should recognize that it is a gift from God and we owe Him praise and worship for being so good to us. Even if you're not saved yet, you should go ahead and praise the Lord and begin to thank the Lord because He has been good enough to give us the gift of life. The Bible tells us many ways that we should worship the Lord. Clapping our hands. Lifting up our hands. Singing, come before the Lord with joyful song. Paul said in Ephesians 5, don't be drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your hearts to the Lord. Shouting praise. Shout for the shout shout to the Lord all the earth. Worship him with gladness. Kneeling before the Lord, dancing before the Lord, playing instruments skillfully and with a loud noise. Praise. Praise and worship should be done out of thanksgiving for what God has done for us. If you look back over your life, there is plenty of reasons to give God thanks. All of the times that He's come through. And maybe sometimes as we get through, get in the midst of troubles, we forget about how faithful God has been. But we need to remind ourselves through praise and through thanksgiving of what God has done for us. How many times He's brought us out. How many trials He's brought us through. How many times that He's raised us up when we thought we were sick and near death. That God has been good and He's sustained us and He's kept us and He's healed us and He's helped us helped us and He's done miracle after miracle and maybe we forget it as we get in the midst of struggle that God is the reason that we're still here and we need to thank God that He's been so good to us. How many miracles has it taken to get you these nine decades, Brother Fess? How many miracles, Sister Adams, has it taken For God to get you through to this point. How many miracles, if we look back over our life, how many times, how many breaths has He given us? How many heartbeats has He given us? How many times has He provided food when we didn't know where it was going to come from? How many times has He come through when we thought we were going to go under? How many times has He held our hand when we didn't know if we were going to be able to keep our sanity? How many times has God been there in the darkness and in the trouble and in the trial and in the tribulation? We need to thank the Lord that we're still here and that God has been good to us and blessed us. Hallelujah. Thanksgiving for what He's done and that He's been faithful. But not only do we need to thank God for what He's done, 
because of the promises of God, we need to thank God for what He's going to do. You don't need to wait until after He's blessed you to go ahead and give Him thanks. You've prayed about it. You can go ahead and start to thank Him for what He's going to do. You don't have to wait until you receive the miracle to go on and say, Thank you, Lord. I know I prayed for it, and I know that you're faithful, and I know that you've heard me. I don't have to see the healing to know that you are a healing God, and I'm going to begin to thank you while my body's still in pain. I'm still going to thank you because I know you're a healer. Even before my kids get saved, I'm going to thank you, Lord, because I know your promise promises in your word and you said all your children will be taught of the Lord and great will be the peace of my children. I might still watch them struggle but I thank you Lord for what you are going to do. Lord I may not see where the money is going to come from to pay this bill but I'm going to go ahead and thank you because you are Jehovah Jireh my provider. I may still feel anxiety and worry but I'm going to go ahead and begin to thank you and say you are Jehovah Shammah. You are the Lord, my peace. Whatever it is that you're struggling with, go ahead and start to thank the Lord and say, Lord, I know your credit's good with me. You may not have done the miracle yet, but you've come through time and time again and I am going to go ahead and thank you and give you praise and worship you in the midst of the midnight because I know that we may endure for the night but joy comes in the morning hallelujah we not only praise him for what he has done and what he's going to do but we need to worship him for who he is see sometimes our praise is in response To what God has done. But there comes a place. Where your faith. Worships God. Whatever he does. You're still going to worship. That's where Job got to. He said though he slay me. Yet. Will I trust him. There is a worship. That says Lord. If you heal me, I'll praise you. If you take me, I'll praise you. It doesn't matter what you do. I'll still worship you because you are God. This is the kind of worship that the seraphim and the cherubim that are around about the throne of God did. They don't worship God for what He has done. They worship God for who He is. And when we get a glimpse of who He is, like the seraphim and the cherubim, we can say, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, we worship You, God. Whether or not You do another miracle, whether or not You answer another prayer, You're still God. You're still the Creator. You're still the Holy Lord, you're still the Savior, you're still God Almighty, and I'll worship you whether or not another prayer is answered. I'll worship you, God, for who you are. Hallelujah. We got to worship Him because of who He is. He is Almighty, He is Creator, He is Alpha. And Omega. He is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He is the Savior. He is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. He is the Creator. He is the Sustainer. He is the Judge. He is the Almighty. He is holy. And we worship Him for who He is. King David, the Bible says, was a man after. God's own heart. And David, you see over and over in the Psalms, he'll begin some of those Psalms and you'll start reading them and it's depressing. But somewhere in the middle of the Psalm, he'll go from 
Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? Why do the wicked prosper? He'll go from looking at all the trouble around him to getting a glimpse of the presence of God. And you'll hear him say things like, I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord than to dwell in the tents of of the wicked. There's something about praise and worship that changes our perspective instead of being concerned about, well, why do they get blessed and why do they get all of this stuff when, when they're living the way that they are to David understanding, I'd rather be in the presence of God and have nothing but just stand at the door of the church and be where the presence and the glory of God is. Like the Levites, they didn't inherit the land and they didn't inherit the possessions of the cities and the towns but it said that the Lord was their portion God was the presence of God it was going to the house of God and being in the presence of God and David understood from the palace hey, I may be a king but what I really want to be is a worshiper I just want to be in the presence of the Lord in the house of God where God's presence and God's spirit is moving So David, he had went from being the shepherd of Israel. The little boy, the stone and sling, and God had exalted him to become king of the land. And David, as he sits on the throne of Israel and he has conquered so many of God's enemies, those that had oppressed and tortured the Philistines, the giants, He's conquered them. And David realizes that a generation before he was ever born, before Saul, the first king, had been crowned in Israel, while Eli was the priest, there had been such sin, such corruption. The Philistines had attacked the people of God. And because they had been living in sin and they were being defeated, they said, well, let's go get that box out of the tabernacle. The Ark of the Covenant. And they sent and they grabbed the Ark and they brought it into battle thinking that if they had a form of godliness but not the power that it would defeat their enemies. But instead... The ark was captured. It went over into Philistine territory. And it was in the Philistine towns for about three months. The Philistines had captured the presence of God in the ark of the covenant. But they didn't like it. It created lots of trouble. They put it in their temples of idolatry. And their poor little idol fell down on its face and got busted up in pieces day gone. It ruined their it ruined their idolatry, their, their temple of worship. So they in trying to get rid of the ark and all the trouble and all the problems it was causing them, they put it on an ox cart. And took two oxen away from their young And sent them and said, if this is really and all this stuff that's been happening isn't a coincidence, that these ox will head back to Israel with the ark. And they did. And the ark went to the house of Abinadab and sat in the house of Abinadab for 50 years. House of Abinadab prospered. Was blessed. See, sometimes I think we wonder about the things that are happening with Christianity and the values that we have inherited on a national level. And those problems, instead of seeing that the real problem is not that they've taken prayer out of schools, it's that we've let it out of our homes. It's not that they've taken the commandments off the walls of schools, it's that we've taken the Scripture out of our teaching in the church. 
And we talk about all these things that are not from God. But, but Abinadab during this time for, for, for almost 50 years, he has the ark. Well, David, as he comes to the throne of Israel, he knows that the people of God need the presence of God back in the tabernacle. Five decades had went by and the presence of God had not been in the church. And at some point, we've got to recognize the core problem. David recognized that the problem is that we need the presence of God back in the church. They had written Ichabod over the tabernacle. They had declared that the glory had been departed. But because decades had went on with things in that problem that that, that they had become used to. Generations had been raised from cradle to 50 years and never knew what it was like to have the presence of God. God, help us not to become used to as normal what God never intended for the house of God. God never intended for us to have church without His presence. God never intended for us to go through the motions of this service and that service without the glory of God. And David recognized that we need the presence of God back in the tabernacle. God help us, little Leatherwood, to recognize that we need the presence and the glory of God back in the house of God. Let us not go another month. Let us not go another year. Let us not go through forms and rituals and traditions without the glory of God. Let us have the presence of God. Let us not become used to it. Let us not declare is normal what God never intended for His people. Amen. And so David, he sins. He sins for the ark. But instead of looking at the Scripture for how God said to bring His presence, David basically says, well, The Philistines sent the ark on a cart. So, let's just use a cart. The Philistines had done it because they were ignorant. They didn't have the Scripture. And somehow, in their lack of knowledge, God still directed and controlled everything. But David had the book. He should have known better. His heart was in the right place in that he wanted the presence of God. But he didn't follow the way of Scripture. You see, in the law of Moses, it says that whenever the ark is to be transported, it had little rings, poles go through the rings, and the priests carry the poles to carry the ark on their shoulder. It was God's way. Well, David said, well, we'll just, we'll just send it on a cart. And so they started the journey. And as they're going with the ark of God's glory, this golden box that had been fashioned during the days of Moses. Inside of it were the stone tablets where God had written the ten words, the commandments. Inside of it was Aaron's rod that had budded and produced almonds to show that Aaron was selected by God as the priest. Inside of the ark... They had manna that was hundreds of years old. Still fresh and vibrant because of the presence of God. This ark that had housed in it the miracles of the past and the glory of God, the presence of God. 
and they just threw it on a cart. Because the Philistines had done that. And it didn't work for the Philistines. So David threw it on a, on a cart and they began the journey. Everything seemed to be okay until the cart hit a rock. A bump in the road. And the ark started to wobble. And one of the guys that was there, Yuza, he didn't want the ark to fall off the cart and smash up all those miracles. So he helped God out. Kept God from falling off the cart. Well, he reached his hand to steady the ark. And when he touched it, he died. David wanted the presence of God. When Yuza dies, they stop the journey. They put the ark in the house of Obed-Edom. And for three months, it stays in the house of Obed-Edom while David throws a little bit of a temper tantrum at God. I wanted your presence, Lord. And you've done went and killed Yuza. He wanted the right thing. But he went about it flippantly. Carelessly. I wonder how many times do we approach the things of God. The work of the kingdom. Half-heartedly. Flippantly without care. Whatsoever your hand finds to do, do it with your might. Find what Scripture says. So David began to research God's Word. He found what God said about how the ark was to be carried. And after he got over his personal little pity party, why me, Lord? Moaning and groaning. You ever throw one of those? Well, that's where David was. After he got over that, he does it the right way. He does it God's way. He brings the ark with the poles carried on the shoulders of the priest. And David even does something beyond what is commanded in Scripture. They've got a journey from the house of Obed-Edom to Jerusalem that is about five miles. And David has the priest every six steps that they take. They stop. And they make a sacrifice. Then they'll take six more steps. They'll stop. And they'll make a sacrifice. Then they'll take six more steps. They'll stop. They'll make a sacrifice. David, that's a slow way to make that journey. It's going to take you days to get from the house of Obed-Edom to the house of the, ta the tabernacle in Jerusalem. But David understood because he was a man after God's own heart. That if you want the presence of God, that there has to be a sacrifice of praise. And that the sacrifice of praise is not just something that you do one time, but it is a walk of praise. You see, sometimes we get so accustomed to, well, I'm going to church to worship. I'm going to church to, to pray. I'm going. But David understood that if we're going to have the presence of God, it's not just an hour on Sunday. It's not just one time that we make the sacrifice, but it is a walk of praise. Would to God that we, maybe every six steps that we take, we say, maybe it's time to just stop and give God a little bit of praise. You're walking through Walmart, you take a 
about six steps and you stop and you just give God a little bit of praise. You're walking through your house and you take about six steps and you decide it's time to just stop and give God a little bit of praise. It's time. Worship and praise is not just an hour on Sunday, but it's a walk. It's a life. It's a lifestyle. It's every every few minutes just stopping and acknowledging God and thanking Him. And if we want the presence of God, it's going to come when we have a walk of the sacrifice of praise. David. When this was happening, the Bible said that David took off his royal garments. He put on the priestly robe. And he danced before the Lord with all his might. There was celebration because God's presence hadn't been in the church for 50 years and it was getting close and it was almost time to bring the ark back into the tabernacle and David said, you know, on a day like this, I don't need to be king. I don't need to have a crown. I don't need to have on a, a royal garment. What I need is just to be another worshiper. I don't want to, I don't care if anybody looks at me as pastor. I just want to be another worshiper. I don't care what title you mean. I just want to be another worshiper. I just want to be in the presence of God. I just want to be where God glory and God's presence is. I don't need you to look at me anyway. And it said he danced before the Lord with all of his might. Would to God that we praise God as David did. David said bless the Lord oh my soul and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Would to God that we would give God a praise that is all of our breath all of our strength, all of our energy, all of our heart all of our soul, all of our might. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, your soul, your strength.